The universe is full of stuff. Heavy stuff, light stuff, hot stuff, and cold stuff. But what about the stuff that you can't see or touch? How do you know that it's there? You can't always count on your senses to tell you what's happening. I mean, what does seeing even really mean, anyway? Absorbing light with your eyes? But what exactly is light? We have a functional understanding of this strange part of everyday life that holds more mysteries than you would think. Understanding it would take centuries of scientific inquiry and research, and we're still trying to tie up the loose ends of some of the existing theories. That's what scientific research is all about. But even with the theories that we have, we've been able to create some amazing technologies with our understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum. The word photon is one that most of you have probably heard somewhere before by now. But what does it actually mean? A Google search will pull up a pretty comprehensive explanation, but that might be a little bit too comprehensive for general purposes. Let's see if we can simplify this wordy explanation down to something a little bit more intuitive. A photon is the smallest basic unit of all light. In vacuum, they travel at the speed of light, denoted by the letter C. The first one on planet Earth to discover photons was none other than Dr. Planarian Flatworm, or in his native language, Schmidti Mediterrani. Some biologists actually believe that the Cambrian explosion was started by the evolution of eyes, but this is still debated amongst biologists. Fast forward a few million years, and humans pop up on the scene. Figuring out what light actually was, was a scientific journey that would take hundreds of years. As discussed on this channel before, many great minds attempted to decipher the mystery of light. Newton was one of the first ones to make major breakthroughs in the area with the publication of optics. But the first one who would really come up with the mathematical form for light was James Maxwell. Electromagnetic radiation was calculated to have the same speed as light. This was not a coincidence in his mind. Light must have a similar nature to this radiation. But hang on, isn't radiation a bad thing? Well, as we'll learn, it's only high energy radiation that can be a problem. The question of how the sun's rays travel through space to warm the earth has been a question that scientists and philosophers have been pondering for ages. In the late 1800s, when Heinrich Hertz first set his hand to this task, he was already armed with the equations that James Maxwell had developed only a few decades before. Maxwell had predicted the existence of electromagnetic radiation by a fluctuating electric field, but Heinrich Hertz was the one who would actually prove it. With an experiment and some physical evidence. To demonstrate the existence of this radiation, Hertz needed a way to generate it, but also to receive it and prove that it was there. It couldn't be seen, so another method needed to be developed in order to detect it. The very first transmitter and receiver was created by Heinrich Hertz. If his name sounds familiar, it's because the unit of frequency, or cycles per second, was named after him. Anything that oscillates, whether it be a pendulum, an electric field, or the air around you, has a frequency frequency, how many times per second it repeats. The frequency of Hertz's radiation was roughly at 50 megahertz, or 50 million times in one second. The implication of his discovery was monumental, but he didn't really think so at the time. Another instance of a smart person making an incorrect prediction, or as I like to call it, famously wrong. But hang on, was he experimenting with photons or with electromagnetic waves? Well, to answer your question, yes. More theories would need to be in place to actually make sense of all this, and more science scientists were constantly experimenting with other kinds of rays as well. The theories that would further illuminate the mysteries of the universe would be built on Hertz's proof. Hertz discovered the existence of radio waves with his experiment. He couldn't see it, but he proved that it was there with another coil across the room completely unconnected. This was the first discovery of electromagnetic radiation, a type of energy traveling through space at the speed of light in the form of alternating electric and magnetic field. He didn't realize it, but he was creating fluctuations in what modern physicists call 
call the electromagnetic field, an invisible ocean of energy surrounding us at all times. But Hertz wasn't the only one experimenting with rays of energy. Another physicist by the name of Wilhelm Röntgen was also exploring the strange nature of rays after the discovery of these Hertzian waves. He experimented with Crookes tubes, and after several experiments, he obtained an interesting result. He noticed that a new type of ray could shine through some materials. Photography was a new phenomenon in contemporary society, and using these ideas in conjunction, Röntgen created the first X-ray images. Unfortunately though, the true nature of these X-rays were still unknown to scientists. The damages that the radiation was causing was mostly unknown to medical practitioners. Appearances of cancer were very common in people who had X-rays taken of them during this time, and it was only after decades of research that this effect was understood. Ionization. Like all scientific researchers, Hertz and Röntgen were limited by the instruments, technologies, and theories of the time. Electricity was already widely adopted, but at this point, there was much unknown about the atomic world. But the work that Hertz and Röntgen did to prove that these rays were of the same nature of light would lay the foundation for the future of science. It wasn't just proving that radio waves could transfer energy invisible to the naked eye. It was also that they did so in a manner very similar to how light did it, just at a different frequency. After the discovery of electromagnetic radiation, the scientific community attempted to understand the physical concepts around the light emitted from heated objects. This revolved around the predicted amount of light that would radiate from something known as a black body radiator. An ideal black body absorbs all of the electromagnetic rays that shine on it, regardless of the incident angle or frequency. If it were at zero temperature, it would be perfectly black. In a practical sense, everything is actually a black body radiator. Everything has an ambient temperature, and in Kelvin, it's actually pretty high. This effect can actually be most easily observed in metals by heating them up to sufficient temperature that they begin to glow. They get so hot that they emit light. The existing theory for the emission of light under classical physics was that such a radiator could continue to heat up, releasing higher and higher energy light until it began to emit ultraviolet light and practically turn invisible to the naked eye. This was according to the Raleigh Jeans Law. Unfortunately though, this was never confirmed by any experiments, and the experimental measurements that they would take diverged greatly from what they predicted. Max Planck was one of the physicists trying to understand this problem, and he took a slightly different approach. He hypothesized that the light was emitted in individual packets. Rather than a continuous stream of water, the light would flow as individual droplets. In the year 1900, Planck published his theory of Planck's Law, which matched the mathematical theory with the empirical data much more closely. The foundation of Planck's Law is regarded as the birth of quantum mechanics and one of the greatest accomplishments of Planck's career. Thanks to things like the mechanized printing press, electrical communication, and a growing international scientific community, science was reaching unprecedented heights of knowledge. I think that these factors actually made it possible for Albert Einstein to become involved in science. When he published his papers in 1905, Max Planck was one of the first to recognize just how important the theory of relativity was. But Max actually disagreed with Einstein's concept of a light quanta, or what scientists now call a photon. Over time though, as you can tell, this theory became generally accepted. And actually, after the idea that light appeared to have the property of wave-particle duality, one scientist wondered if other objects in the quantum world could share that property. Louis de, Br Louis de Broglie, Louis? I don't know. Louis de Broglie founded the theory of the electron wave. He proved that electrons actually shared a similar duality that light did. In some circumstances, it behaved as a wave, and in others, a particle. It just depended on the context. The theory of the electron wave is actually quite important in modern times, because most graphene devices use this theory in the design phase. For the most part, these devices are found in cutting-edge scientific research, not really found in everyday life. But the cutting edge of scientific research builds upon the work of all of these great scientists, and over the course of just a few short decades, these scientific advancements have led to leaps and bounds in technological development.
In the 21st century, we have many different ways of taking advantage of ripples in this invisible ocean of energy that exists on both sides of our narrow band of visible light. Radios, routers, smartphones, Bluetooth, all of these take advantage of lower energy radiation. Streams of these photons will just gently wash over you, gently rolling over you like a wave in the real ocean. The electric and magnetic fields will just pass through you, usually with no ill effect. However, when a ripple in this invisible ocean becomes more powerful, this is when a problem can occur. Rather than washing over you like a gentle wave, they basically slam into you like a fire hose. The term ionization actually refers to the formation of ions by these high energy photons. They have so much energy that when they hit the molecules that make up your body, they unbalance the stable bonds that hold the molecules together, changing them from stable atoms into ions, charged atoms. This effect only lasts a few microseconds as the charge neutralizes, but the change to the molecule can be an extremely serious problem for the overall function of the cell. If a cell's DNA is changed, it can change the way the cell reproduces. This is how radiation can cause sickness and cancer. But remember, it's just the stuff on the high energy end of the spectrum, usually emitted by what we would call radioactive objects. These objects are still emitting gamma radiation because they've been energized by some source. But in most people's lives, this isn't a problem that we have to deal with very often. Most everyday applications just use the stuff on the lower energy end of the spectrum. Even the MRI machine uses a specialized radio coil for capturing its images. But I think we've covered enough for this time. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. This has been your Everyday Engineer, signing off.